innovative analytics at Smith and hopefully inspire conversations and collaboration amongst students, faculty, and the larger business community. We're supported in this mission by our corporate sponsors, uh, Deloitte, KPMG, and Merkel. And through our collaborations, we're able to bring to you thought leadership in the realm of analytics. And today's talk is a, is a prime example. So we're very happy to be able to, to host today Professor Sinan Aral from MIT. Um, Sinan is the David Austin Professor of Management at MIT, where he's a professor of IT and marketing and a professor in the Institute of Data Systems and Society, where he co-leads MIT's initiative on the digital economy. He was the chief scientist at Social Am, one of the first social commerce analytics companies, and at Human. He's currently a founding partner at Manifest Capital and on the advisory board of the Alan Turing Institute and the British National Institute of Data Science in London. Um, I could go on to read this, but then I take up his entire hour. So uh, what I will say is um, today we'll be talking about uh, Sinan's new book, The Hype Machine. And uh, we've actually purchased some copies of his book and we will be randomly selecting some winners. So hopefully your email addresses were correct because we'll be reaching out to you at the end of this hour to notify you if uh, you were one of the winners of his book. I'm joined today by my colleague, Professor Gordon Gao, um, who will be moderating today's event. So between the two of us, we hope to be able to um, guide your questions to Sinan. So let me pass it off to Gordon at this point. Thank you, Vidad. So I think this is the event that I've been looking forward to for weeks. You know, when I heard that Sinan is willing to do this book talk, I'm super excited. The reason is that I am probably one of the few who have, re have read this book already. And you see the, the, my, my notes here. So it's a fantastic book with amazing ideas in it. What's more, Sinan is not only a scholar, right? He is a veteran and he has done, founded two companies, has right, directing a lot of uh, startups these days. So I'm pretty sure that we're going to learn a lot from him about the insights of happening in the industry about social media analytics, about social marketing and things and so on. So without further ado, let me shift over to Sinan. Thanks everybody. It's really great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, and it's great to see you, Gordon, and uh, to meet you, Widad, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. For those of you who get unlucky in the random draw of books, uh, this is where you can find the book. I've put it into the chat. Uh, and if you're interested in the ideas, uh, you, can go, uh, you can go find it there. So I'm just gonna do a very quick whirlwind tour of the book uh, so that you have a sense for what it's about. And I'll try not to talk for too long so that we can really make this a discussion and uh, a freewheeling question and answer. And I, that's my favorite part of it. So let me share my screen, do a quick whirlwind tour of the book and then uh, have a, a, a conversation. Give me one sec. Everybody see the screen, is that working? Okay, fantastic, great news. Okay, so, um, you know, look, we are one week away from possibly the most consequential election in a hundred years in the United States. And if we think back to what happened in 2016, there was a tremendous amount of manipulation and interference in the 2016 election from Russia. They sent manipulative messages to 126 million people on Facebook, 20 million uh, people on Instagram, 10 million tweets uh, from accounts with 6 million followers on Twitter, and 43 hours of YouTube content. And if you fast forward to today, uh, we're no better off than we were four years ago uh, in potentially a much more consequential election uh, where Russia has become a lot more sophisticated, uh, for instance, they are nudging American citizens to spread misinformation rather than impersonating them to get around platform policies against inauthentic content and accounts. They've moved their servers to domestic soil to avoid surveillance because our intelligence agencies have a harder time surveilling uh, on domestic soil. 
They've infiltrated Iran's cyber war department, perhaps to launch attacks made to look like they came from Tehran. We've got new uh, announcements uh, from the Director of National Intelligence this week that Russia and Iran have voter data, uh, which can be used to target manipulative messages at people. And we know that they are targeting uh, uh, intimidation messages at voters in Florida to try to affect voter turnout. And all of this is happening during a global pandemic with civil unrest in the streets from the justifiable social movements around bl police brutality in the United States. Uh, and we're seeing a slow roll of platform policies in the last couple of weeks uh, before the election to try and tamp down misinformation or to prevent campaigns from calling the election early and so on. Uh, but we could have been doing a lot more over the last four years, and we should have been from the platform side and from the policy side. But it's not just about elections in terms of how social media affects our society and, uh, and, and our lives. Uh, in 2013, the AP Twitter handle put out this tweet, which said, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. And this tweet was retweeted 4,000 times in five minutes and it went viral thereafter. But this wasn't real news. This was fake news that was propagated by Syrian hackers that had hacked the AP Twitter handle. And unfortunately, social media, what I call the hype machine, uh, is not does not exist in isolation. It is coupled with all sorts of other socio-technical systems uh, for example, in this case, automated trading algorithms that trade on the sentiment uh, in social media and those automated trading algorithms, when they caught wind of the fact that Barack Obama might have been injured or killed in an explosion in the White House, that sentiment is obviously not good. They started trading and they uh, sent sell orders uh, in to all of their um, institutional investors. And it triggered a drop in the market, which wiped out $140 billion of equity value in a matter of minutes. And that's from one tweet. And we have trillions of tweets uh, in real time from hundreds of millions of people every day that are affecting the outcomes of markets, of businesses, and so on. So it's about elections and democracy. It's about our markets and our businesses but it's also about our public health, the impact of social media. So there's a ton of fake news uh, going around uh, about COVID. Some of it are fake cures that have harmed people and even killed people. But what we're looking at at the IDE, the Initiative on the Digital Economy, which I direct at MIT, we're running the largest global survey on COVID behaviors, perceptions, and norms, asking people about things like whether they would go to restaurants or go back to work and under what policies. And one block of questions that we're asking about is vaccine confidence. How confident are you in a vaccine? And would you take a vaccine? And that is... Uh, fluctuating with the spread of misinformation. When Russia announced its Sputnik vaccine, it reduced vaccine confidence around the world. And if we don't uh, take the vaccine, it's going to dramatically affect the trajectory of the pandemic. But before COVID and foreshadowing the impact of fake news in the COVID pandemic was the measles outbreaks of 2019. So I don't know if you know this, but measles is an incredibly deadly disease. It's way more uh, contagious than coronavirus. And it was eradicated in the United States in the year 2000. In 2010, there were 63 cases of measles. In the first half of 2019 alone, there were 1,250 cases, an 1,800% increase. And these outbreaks were happening in communities like Rockland County, New York, and Clark County, Washington. And if you look at the data, as I have, on Facebook ad buys for anti-vaccine content, what you'll see is they are targeted at these tight-knit communities, and they spread within these tight-knit communities, causing vaccine hesitance, uh, reducing the number of vaccinations, and creating outbreaks of diseases that we should have, uh, uh, that we had and could have maintained as eradicated, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and this is all due to what I call the hype machine, the social media industrial complex, platforms like Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, Pinterest, WhatsApp, WeChat, Snapchat. And these platforms are having an outsized effect on our society, our elections, our democracy, our public health, uh, our businesses, our markets, and so on. 
Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. I'm a big fan of the movie, The Social Dilemma, which raises the red flag about the specter of the potential negative impacts of social media. But we have to remember that social media also has a tremendous amount of positive potential. So when Nepal experienced its greatest earthquake in 100 years, Europe donated $3 million to relief efforts, the US 10 million, and Facebook spun up a donate now button and raised 15.5 million more than Europe and the US combined from 770,000 individual donors in 175 countries. That's really an example of the mobilizing potential of social media to coordinate large scale action across the globe uh, for the good of society in ways uh, that we can see repeated in many different examples. So a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. understand that social media is an incredibly important catalyst and coordinator and an accelerator of important social movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, the founders of which say this movement couldn't exist without social media. Before that, it was the Arab Spring, the Snow Revolution in Russia, the uh, protests in Hong Kong and Ukraine and so on. People make fun of the uh, ice bucket challenge, but it's really hard to laugh at uh, a movement that raised a quarter of a billion dollars with a B in eight weeks for ALS research. These technologies are incredibly powerful at uh, creating social change and mobilizing humanity to solve some of our biggest problems. Not only that, but these social platforms create a ton of economic opportunity. Research at the MIT IDE, as well as at Stanford estimates that Facebook creates $370 billion in consumer surplus every year in the US alone. Now imagine that worldwide and remember that Facebook is the internet in some countries like in the Philippines and in parts of Africa. It is the source of jobs, of life-saving health information, of meaningful human connection, of uh, you know, retraining and of uh, reskilling and so on. Now, we've experienced a bit of a COVID-180, but before the pandemic, social media was a pariah. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen called it the greatest propaganda machine in history at his uh, keynote at the Anti-Defamation League. Before the Social Dilemma movie, there was the Great Hack on Netflix. There's the Delete Facebook movement. Now the Stop Hate for Profit movement, obviously the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, but when the pandemic hit and we were all forced off the streets and onto our laptops and desktops, these platforms broke records every day. There was unprecedented demand for Facebook and Twitter and other platforms. Mark Zuckerberg was quoted as saying, we're just trying to keep the lights on over here. A lot of digital Luddites that had never used these technologies uh, logged in, and I think a lot of them are gonna stay logged in after the pandemic is over. Right now, we are at a crossroads in the social media uh, economy. We're at a crossroads between privacy on one hand and insecurity on the other, between free speech and hate speech, between truth and falsity, between democracy on one hand and authoritarianism on the other, between meaningful human connection and political polarization. And although social media doesn't cause all of these outcomes by themselves, uh, by itself, I should say, it plays a role in all of them. And we are at a crossroads on what we do with social media. What we do in the next 18 to 24 months is going to be essential on the world that we create for ourselves. Now, the book really goes under the hood of how social media works. Chapter four is called Your Brain on Social Media. It details all of the neuroscience evidence of how social media affects our brains. So for instance, you may not know this, but uh, Homo sapiens have uh, one of the largest brains relative to our body weight of any species on the planet, as well as the, one of the largest neocortex ratios, the ratio of the neocortex to the rest of the brain of any species on the planet. And the leading um, hypothesis for why that's the case, you might be surprised, is known as the social brain hypothesis, which there's a lot of evidence for uh, showing that the reason human beings have such large brains is that we evolved to process social signals, that our complex sociality, you know, we're one of the most complex, we are the most complex social species on the planet. We have organizations of hundreds of thousands of people. We coordinate all over the world with digital technologies. Uh, and 
as our brains evolved over um, millions of years to process social signals, we then invented a technology that created the uh, scalable real-time streams of massive amounts of social signals from what your cousin ate for dinner last night, uh, pictures of what you know your brother's kids are doing on Instagram, to what restaurants people went to and what food they're eating, to what they like and what they share and what they believe uh, in these real-time streams uh, every day through multiple platforms. And when you consider that we evolved to process these social signals, the meteoric rise of social media is kind of unsurprising because it's like tossing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. And this chapter also goes into the dopamine reward system and how Sean Parker told Mike Allen in an interview in 2017 that, yeah, we designed Facebook to give you dopamine hits when you got likes and shares of your content to keep you coming back for more so that you would produce more content and like and share other people's content. This chapter also goes into how it affects our kids' brains. I'm the father of a seven-year-old, so I was very interested to dig in deeply to the neuroscience evidence uh, on how this technology is affecting our kids. The chapter immediately following the neuroscience chapter goes into the economics of the technology and how network effects drives the entire social media economy and how that enabled Facebook to defeat MySpace. So there's this little known economics paper in 1974 written by Jeffrey Rolfs, which in the section five of this obscure paper foreshadows Facebook's exact go-to-market strategy and shows you the economics of why that strategy would be able to overcome such a market leader like MySpace was um, by uh, uh, activating tight-knit groups of people that are tightly connected to each other and grafting yourself onto the social network of humanity. That's what happened with Facebook's go-to-market strategy that focused on college campuses where everybody knew each other and where on spy and MySpace you were really strangers with other uh, with other um, users. That combined with these technological walled gardens that lock us in are creating a lot of the market failures that I describe in the book. So we can't take our data with us from Instagram. I know a lot of people use Instagram as a digital diary. We can't take our pictures, our very memories with us from Facebook, Instagram, and so on. Uh, and as I describe in the book, uh, the solutions really start with creating competition uh, in this industry, and that really starts with tearing down these walled gardens. The book goes under the hood of all of the major analytics and algorithms of this technology. Uh, and I know here at uh, the Smith Analytics Consortium, we are really interested in the sort of AI and machine learning under the hood. And uh, I made sure to go deeply into the science of exactly how all of these technologies work. And I described this as a hype loop between machine intelligence and human behavior. And I go into the details of the feed algorithms and the people you may know or friend suggestion algorithms. The PYMK people you may know algorithms direct the evolution of the human social network online. And then the feed algorithms direct the flow of information over that network, which has everything to do with impacts on voting and shopping behavior even dating behavior. You may su be surprised to know that uh, algorithmically created romantic matches surpassed traditional methods of creating romantic matches in 2013. What are the impacts of that on human evolution? How are those, how are the, the is the genetic diversity of the offspring that we're gonna create from romantic relationships driven by algorithms going to be different than the offspring we would create from romantic relationships driven by more traditional forms of meeting or introduction. The book has this framework that describes the three technologies that create the hype machine, the three trends that this creates in our society, which is personalized mass persuasion, hyper-socialization, and an attention economy, which creates a tyranny of, tyranny of trends. But then it really focuses on 
four levers that we have for steering this technology towards the good and away from the evil of social media. And that's money, code, norms, and laws. Money being the business models that create incentives for how the platforms and the users behave, the code, how the platforms are designed and how the algorithms are designed, the norms, how we adopt and use the technology, and obviously the laws, how we regulate this technology. Now, I love the Social Dilemma movie, and I also loved uh, Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff and Zucked by Roger McNamee and The Great Hack movie before The Social Dilemma. And these books and movies are great because they all raise the clarion call of what do we do about social media. But my book takes off where these books and movies end, which is to ask, what do we do? What can we concretely do to get out of the social media morass that we find ourselves in? And I take a rigorous and very detailed approach to making recommendations on how we solve the social media crisis. One big question that we have today is, should we break up Facebook, for example? And I take a very um, measured uh, position on this in the book because this economy is driven by network effects, it tips towards monopolies. If you break up the market leader, you're just gonna tip the next Facebook-like company into market dominance. What we need is structural reform of the social media economy in the form of interoperability, data portability, and social network portability. And I explain how that's just a, an analogy to when we were able to, by law, take our cell phone number with us when we switched uh, carriers, and how we forced AOL Instant Messenger become interoperable with MSN Messenger and Yahoo Messenger, and how that reduced the concentration in the messenger market and eventually created a ton of competition in that market, and how uh, portability, number of portability in the cell phone market create, created $880 million of consumer surplus every quarter in Europe for years and years after it was legislated. I argue that breaking up Facebook will not solve the social media crisis. We need structural reform of the social economy, and I have an in-depth economic analysis of why that's the case. Also, we have to think about what we're going to do about privacy legislation. We have a patchwork of solutions in the United States. Eventually, we're going to need harmonization, but we can learn from the mistakes and the successes of GDPR to design an even better uh, privacy legislation in the United States. We've written extensively about how we protect our elections from social media manipulation, what types of laws we need and platform changes that we need. The point of this book is that we can achieve the promise of social media while avoiding the peril. And the book, The Hype Machine, describes how we do that and how we must adapt. So with that, I'm just going to stop talking and turn this back into a conversation, stop my share. Uh, Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Sinan. You know, the book again is full of insights and fascinating stories. And I know it's based on years of your research, right? So there's no denial that you're the most brilliant researcher in this field. And I've known you for 10 years, I can say that with confidence. Uh, actually, one thing that uh, uh, like struck me was in 2018, in the Science Magazine, which is the most prestigious right, magazine, I think it's a March issue. It has a cover story that is based on your research. And that is about lies and rumors that spread way faster than truth. Uh, so do you have any thoughts about then how we can make sure that high quality information is spreading on the internet, the social network? Anything yeah. You can do? Yeah, so this was our 10 year study of the spread of false news online uh, with Twitter, we got access to the entire Twitter historical archive Jack Dorsey personally supported this project inside of Twitter and we published this study on the cover of science in 2018. What we found was that false news travels farther faster deeper and more broadly than the truth in every category of information, sometimes by an order of magnitude. Uh, and then uh, in the book, I detail uh, what we can do about the false news crisis uh, that we have. And there are a number of important solutions. So uh, 
start with labeling. So when we buy food to consume, it's extensively labeled by law. We know how many calories it has, how many trans fats, and if it's produced in a facility that produces wheat and peanuts, if you have an allergy, but we don't have any of the same types of labels about the information that we consume. But if we had that kind of provenance to what we were consuming in an information sense, we could make better decisions about what we believe and share. So large scale experimental studies that we've conducted at the MIT IDE, uh, big credit to Dave Rand and Gordon Pennycook for uh, conducting a couple of these studies very recently show that if you nudge people to be reflective, they believe fake news less and they share it less. They've shown that a simple nudge that works is to ask people uh, whether they consider this headline to be true or false, whether this article is true or false, just forcing them to think about the veracity of a headline uh, puts them into reflective mode, which makes them less susceptible to fake news in their stream, even after that particular news story has gone by. They believe fake news less, they share it less. Oh, and by the way, if you were to scale that across all of the social media platforms, you would collect tons of labels about what the crowd thinks about the veracity of these, uh, of these stories. And you could couple that with the machine learning algorithms that the platforms have and are innovating on, plus the human moderators. Facebook has hired 35,000 of them. If you created a scalable system that combined the machine learning with the human moderators and the crowd, I think you could start to make inroads uh, towards uh, reducing the spread of falsity online. What we see the platforms doing now a few weeks before the election is slowing information down. Facebook, uh, Twitter is saying you can't retweet without quote tweeting from October 26th to the election time. Now they're nudging you to before you retweet a story, you have to, they say, hey, do you want to click on this link and read the story before you retweet it? This is all designed to slow information down. WhatsApp reduced the number of reshares to five and then one in order to reduce the spread of COVID misinformation. If falsity travels so much faster than the truth, then maybe slowing all the information down will allow the truth to catch up with falsity. We still don't know if this is gonna be a solution. We're looking into it, but the platforms are taking some measures. Labeling is a, is a, is a good example. And by the way, the platforms have done a number of things recently uh, that get at um, misinformation. Facebook has banned QAnon. They should have done it years ago. Uh, and now they're starting to cl clean QAnon conspiracy theories out of Facebook. They have just in the last two weeks said that uh, Holocaust denialism will no longer be tolerated on Facebook. They should have done that years ago. Uh, in my mind, this is a bit of a slow roll, but you can see the zeitgeist in society bringing this to attention, rejecting uh, the platform's non-action, and I think that's forcing some changes. Thank you. Dinan, we actually have uh, someone from the audience who would like to ask a question. So David Mayberg, if you'd like to ask your question. Okay. Uh, you need to unmute David. We need, I think we need to unmute him maybe. He is actually. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi, David. Uh, you were unmuted for a second. Okay, so maybe while we figure out what's going on with David, we do have another question. So no, no, I'm, I've, I've been on mute. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is David. I'm an MBA student uh, at the Smith School. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, really thank you so much for that last little bit because, you know, it is an age old principle that if, you know, you're unsure of an action to take, always wait for more available information. And the fact that, you know, now social media companies are, are simply realizing just because you can doesn't mean you should as a solution. I mean, what you said about the reflectiveness just really makes a lot of sense. And, and hopefully, you know, if, if it was, you know, the president who forced this, you know, hopefully it will still apply for other things after the election. But, but the question I do want to ask is uh, related to the, uh, you know, misinformation and the Russia stuff, which is that in 2016, with, you know, Donald Trump being an unknown, it was, you know, and uh, it was a much different choice than today. But at this point, people's opinions are pretty well established. So the thing I keep being just very, uh, you know, sort of befuddled by when I look at data is 
who are these undecided voters that can be swayed? And, and, and maybe there's a percentage of them, but how does it change a poll by 16 percentage points? You know what I mean? After, you know, uh, you know, a debate, you know, as the example, like, you know, from the debate with Trump, uh, information about Hunter Biden, Ukraine, who is that swaying on the Democratic side in terms of their willingness to vote for Joe Biden, whether it's true information or it's false put out by some source? So all so great questions, great comment, great question. So uh, the book goes into detail on all of the scientific evidence that we have to date about how social media affects voting. And I agree with you. The evidence that social media affects vote choice is weak to non-existent. But the real worry is that it affects voter turnout. And now in an unprecedented election year, in my mind, it's not the vote, but the violence that we should be concerned about. So I can't believe that this is coming out of my mouth, but we had a plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, okay? And we have armed militias. I don't know if you've been following, but uh, gun and ammo sales are through the roof. So what I'm most worried about is voter turnout effects and violence. Uh, around um, whether or not the election results are accepted by either side. Um, I think that the evidence that this sways uh, voters to vote for the other candidate is weak to non-existent. That's not really how social media manipulation works. Social media manipulation works by reducing voter turnout, intimidating people from voting. And remember, the 2016 election was decided by about 77,000 votes in three states. So, and we also know that Russia's misinformation is targeted at swing states. So, and we also know that about 95% of all of the misinformation that came over Instagram was voter suppression misinformation targeted at minorities uh, and so the real worry is voter suppression, intimidation, voter turnout, and in this election year, particularly violence, which I think I'm concerned more, more about than swaying, you know, the mythical undecided voter at this point. So we have two more questions from the audience. I'll just read them. So this is Eveline Schum. And she asked the question, you pointed out pros and cons of social media. What do you think is critical to measure or somehow quantify to determine the net benefit outcome? For example, how do we quantify social good, money flowing to needed areas versus the effects of privacy concerns? Perhaps you have a model outlined in your book? Great question. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not a big believer in sort of universal models that try to quantify the overall net benefit of social media. There are so many things that are difficult to quantify, which makes the solutions, there's, which means that there's no silver bullet solution to get the good and avoid the bad. It's unavoidable that we have to be nuanced, rigorous, and scientific and do the detailed hard work on all of the issues. So let me give you the answer. Uh, there are tons of uh, market failures that arise because the, uh, the difficult to quantify societal effects of social media are not internalized as costs by the platforms. For instance, how do you quantify the harmful effect of social media on democracy? And how would Facebook ever put that onto, into a number that they could quantify as affecting their bottom line? The answer is that they can't just like a company doesn't quantify the bottom line profit loss effect of their pollution, which is another example of a market failure that requires regulation. So we have an information ecosystem that is uh, experiencing multiple market failures, privacy, the spread of misinformation, hate speech versus free speech, um, authoritarian crackdowns on minority opinions and journalists in places like the Philippines. Maria Reza in the Philippines is a friend and a digital fellow of the MIT IDE, which I direct. And these things are not something that the platforms will uh, internalize as costs. I think that what we need to do is as researchers and analytics practitioners, we need to quantify in each case. 
So I think, for instance, we can study the effect of social media on democracy uh, on its own. We have all of the methods are known. The uh, paper that I showed you, uh, protecting social, um, protecting our elections from social media manipulation, is a paper that Dean Eccles and I published in Science. And it outlines how we study the effect of social media on democracy and how we can prevent its harmful effects. Then we can study uh, effects on free speech and hate speech and from you know, nudging speech, uh, sorry, chilling speech and so on. Each of these requires in-depth analysis on its own. I don't think that there's some universal model that will get us to some you know, benefit and cost calculation that, that tells us, you know, the net benefit of social media. I think we need to do our best to solve each market failure one by one, starting with creating competition in the so social media uh, economy, uh, which will be done by interoperability and data portability and social network portability. Thank you, Sinan. I think externality is definitely something that we overlooked. And I agree with you that quantifying, right, being pre more precise is very important. So related to business analytics, so we have spent billions of dollars, right, on social media marketing. And in your book, actually, you cited some alarming, you know, examples like a PNG. I actually decided to cut $200 million budget from digital marketing and get better results. How could that be? I mean, how this enlightened us as a business anal analysts? Yeah, this was this was a fascinating story to discover. I don't know if you know um, Mark Pritchard. He's the chief brand officer of uh, Procter and Gamble. He's a 38 year veteran of P and G. Uh, he went to the IAB in 2017 and gave a keynote where he basically called out uh, social media and digital marketing as being a completely um, you know uh, opaque, uh, not well measured as it could be or should be. Um, industry with opaque industry uh, agency contracts and not a lot of transparency on click fraud and so on. And then he said, we are cutting our digital marketing budget by $200 million. And the pundits and gurus, you know, you know, shuddered at this. And they said, there's no way that PNG can do this. They're going to contract. They're never going to be able to grow sales. And instead, what PNG did was they grew sales by seven and a half percent, nearly doubling their industry's average while they were cutting spending by $200 million. And I describe in the book how they did that. They did that really by becoming much more targeted, smart, and sophisticated using data and analytics to be more effective with their mm -hmm. messaging. So what they found, uh, they did four things. One, they reduced the uh, focus on frequency and instead, instead shifted it to reach. So instead of hitting the same uh, consumers with multiple uh, social media messages or advertisements, they reduced the frequency of touches on each consumer and increased the number of consumers they were touching once at all. They reduced their frequency by 10%, increased their reach in China by 10%. Second, targeting, targeting, targeting. They created a database of uh, first party data on a billion unique people. And then they started marketing, not to generic audiences like women 18 to 49, but smart audiences like first time moms or first time washing machine owners. Third, they rationalized all of their agency contracts saving between 750 million to a billion dollars. And finally, when COVID hit, they doubled down and increased spending on digital marketing because everyone was online. This is an example of how we use analytics to be smart about digital marketing. The message about analytics and marketing in the book is that uh, it's the uh, you know, most widely uh, used shell game in business today. Digital marketing and its effectiveness is wildly oversold by metrics that do not properly measure the impact of digital marketing and social media, but digital marketing and social media can be incredibly effective if you do it right and you measure it right. And the book describes actually how you do that. Thank you very much. So we have a next question from a Harshit Bansal, which is related to what you discussed just now. So if we do it right, right, then it's very powerful. Uh, but how should people do to not get biased by the echo chambers of a social network? 
So is this in the, in, uh, we should ask, is this about uh, business or is this about the uh, filter bubble and polarization of, of the really algorithms? More, more like the later, but I would love to get okay. your thoughts on the, okay. on the former as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, so the book, so uh, chapter 10 of the book is called The Wisdom and the Madness of Crowds. And it's all about political polarization. Is social media pulling us apart? Are filter bubbles true? Is echo chamber uh, true? What's the scientific evidence for that? And so James Surowiecki wrote this great book in 2004 called um, The Wisdom of Crowds, which was actually based on Sir Francis Galton's you know, wisdom of crowds idea 100 years before that. And this is a great book. I love this book. I've read it many times. But the only problem with this book is it was written in the same year that Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook. And the wisdom of crowds is built on four sort of underlying assumptions. Uh, the independence of opinions in the crowd, the diversity of opinions in the crowd, and the equality of voice of those opinions in the crowd and social media destroys all three of those pillars. And so in that uh, chapter, I go through all of the evidence of, is this making us smarter as a society or is it pulling us apart and polarizing us? When it comes to polarization, uh, it is a very tricky subject. So if you dive into all of the real evidence on polarization, what you find uh, is three things. One, that ideological polarization hasn't changed in the United States for 50 years. What has changed is political polarization because the parties have uh, aligned on certain sets of beliefs that are different from each other. Uh, and so there's tremendous rise in affective political polarization, but not that much difference in what Americans generally believe uh, about ideology. Uh, they're just completely separated and polarized politically. Um, and there's a lot of hatred between the, the, the parties. Uh, secondly, what you find is that there's a lot of evidence for many different things that contribute to polarization, including cable news, uh, you know, uh, and many, many other things. And when you look into the effect of social media on polarization and you look at the large scale experimental evidence, most of which right now is in the form of working papers that are in the process of being peer reviewed. So literally hot off the press, uh, there's a consensus building that the algorithms of social media tend to reduce the diversity of content that we are uh, exposed to, tend to uh, give us the content that we that conforms with our beliefs tend to give us content that is similar to what our networks believe and a lot different than what networks were unconnected to believe and that this can create political polarization uh, in the United States. Um, but it's not the only driver. So social media isn't the only thing responsible for polarization. Obviously we have uh, political candidates that are very polarizing. We have cable news that is very polarizing. And there's a lot of other factors uh, that are polarizing as well, but it seems like the algorithms contribute. What can we do? Um, we can seek out diversity. A big uh, experiment that we conducted on Spotify showed that when you do the algorithmic recommendations, it narrows what you consume. But when you turn the algorithmic recommendations off, uh, it, you go back to your diverse listening habits, which means that our preferences are resilient to the algorithms. Also, uh, you can look at multi-objective uh, algorithms that also try to introduce diversity. A great example is Spotify's, um, uh, um, what is that called? The uh, daily, the, the digest or the uh, um, new music that they recommend to you. It can create diversity if they're programmed well. And I think all of these uh, things can be pursued simultaneously, both, both from the platform perspective and the user perspective, and they're all covered in the book. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Hao Jiang. And the question is about uh, what is the responsibility of social media companies? Like, uh, should they do the fact checking, right? So, and uh, then uh, are they responsible for the false information? Things like that. Yeah. Related, sorry, yeah, related to, I wonder actually, yeah, what is your thought about then, uh, the responsibility of the social media companies in terms of 
like transparency, right? They algorithm used to filter out messages. And you have a nice write up in chapter 11 about the transparency paradox. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, I do think that the platforms need to proactively take responsibility for cleaning up the information ecosystem that they have so much undue influence on. And uh, this is a complicated question. So for instance, we have section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which essentially shields social media platforms, but lots of other internet platforms from civil liability about what their users post to uh, their platforms. This also applies to the commenting section of the New York Times. It also applies to Wikipedia. It also applies to reviews and so on. And section 230 is an essential enabler of the internet, of free internet, of innovation on the internet. So I don't believe in sort of, um, you know, eliminating or retracting section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. But I do believe that the platforms need to take responsibility for moderating fake news and hate speech. I think they need to find scalable solutions that combine machine learning with the crowd with human moderators in order to do that. For example, as I described for fake news and kind of stepping back for a minute and thinking at the 30,000 foot view, I think the real leaders of, the, of what I call the new social age will be those platform leaders that realize that this short-term engagement-based um, shareholder value strategy is not sustainable. So hyping, the reason I call it the hype machine is because the algorithms hype us up by uh, trying to engage us with salacious, shocking, you know, uh, content that boils our blood, that favors fake news and so on. Um, and that is a very short-sighted strategy because it pollutes our information ecosystem. It creates a zeitgeist of backlash from the delete Facebook movement to the stop hate for profit movement to a regulatory backlash. That's not sustainable as the platforms are finding out. What the, what the visionary leaders of the new social age will realize is that long-term shareholder values uh, aligning long-term shareholder values and societal values is the only way towards a sustainable outcome for them, both from a shareholder value perspective, but also from their effect on society's perspective. And I think that they're starting to get that message that they can't just continue to um, neglect that they, the impact that they have on society and continue to pursue short-term uh, profit motives they have to take more responsibility for their effect on our information ecosystem. Great, thank you very much. So I also wonder, you have you know, founded two companies in the social media area. And in our audience, we have a lot of people interested in uh, you know, advancing their career in this domain. Uh, maybe you can share with us, right, uh, your uh, you know, insights about what you see the need, what is the gap, and how to make it happen. Also, what's the current trends going on that we need to pay attention to? Yeah, so, um, you know, at MIT, I, I focus on analytics in my teaching. So I teach the analytics lab, which is a, a very popular sort of data science for business course. And uh, I teach digital marketing and social media analytics. So there's a lot of data science and analytics to what I teach. I'm obviously an entrepreneur and now a venture capitalist investor. And so I'm evaluating about 300 startups a year uh, in terms of uh, investing and have founded and sold two startups before that, which were heavily analytics and data science focused. And I think that one thing, just stepping back from kind of like the details of data science um, uh, that uh, I think people miss as they try to pursue an analytics career or a data science career, is how much creativity is required to be a great uh, business analytics professional or a great uh, data scientist. It really requires a lot of creativity and the place where that shows up most often is in uh, one's ability to ask the right questions. That skill, that very uh, difficult to quantify skill is probably in my mind, the most important skill uh, that a data scientist could have or a business analyst could have. Um, I also believe that it 
it requires a healthy dose of humility from being able to recognize uh, where you're wrong and how you can uh, sort of um, uh, being able to admit that you don't know something, being able to admit that that something you did uh, wasn't the best way and uh, tweaking and adapting uh, your analytics strategy and approach as you go, I think is really important. When I look to uh, hire people into the companies that we are um, invested in and so on, uh, uh, people who try to portray uh, like they know it all and people who aren't willing to admit that they don't know an answer to an interview question um, is a red flag for me. I would much rather uh, see somebody express humility and uh, say that they don't know than to pretend like they do know. And uh, people who are creative, people who can really ask the right questions, uh, being incredibly important intangible skills uh, for being a great data scientist in my mind or, or business analyst. Thank you very much. I think as a follow-up to that, you know, given the discussion so far, and at, from the role of an educator, it makes me wonder how should we be teaching and conveying business analytics and its intersectionality with ethics? And I'm curious about your experience. So, and then it just is hearing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is absolutely essential. So, um, just this week in my analytics class, I stopped on this point and really took, you know, 10 minutes to really uh, have a conversation with our class about it. And the point that I made was that you might think that you're just running some regressions, you know, or you might think that you're just building some algorithm, but these regressions and, and this algorithm or these algorithms that you're building into products on platforms every day are going to affect outcomes for people. If the data that you use to power those algorithms or those predictive models is biased, maybe it's going to affect you know, uh, the targeting of women uh, with STEM uh, job advertisements online. Maybe it's going to have racial bias in it. Maybe it's going to uh, create outcomes that you're not thinking about. And the point is that we have to as data scientists and business analysts be thinking about that front and center every day uh, when we write algorithms, when we write code, when we build predictive models and so on, it's absolutely essential to a business education in my mind. It is, it is, it is one of the pillars of creating good uh, business analytics and or data science um, graduates uh, in today's age. And one thing, one thing that I'll say, uh, another thing that I think is fundamental to business education with regard to analytics and, and data science is learning by doing. I think that this is not something that you can learn by reading a textbook only. You have to roll your sleeves up and actually do it. So all of my classes have real data from real companies uh, that are part of the work we do every day in class as uh you know, building predictive models or building algorithms. We work with real data from real companies um, every day of our classes. And I think that's really, really important. As uh, Yogi Berra once said, uh, you know, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is, uh, which means that you really have to roll your sleeves up and you can't just sit in your ivory tower and expect to become a great business analyst or data scientist. You have to learn by doing. That's fantastic. So that's what we emphasize at Smith School as well, like experiential learning, right? So it's, it's really not easy because, you know, we need a lot more preparation rather than just doing a lecturing. So that's right. It's harder to deliver that education, way harder, uh, um, but, but essential. Got it. So I, I really like one quote from your book. It's a chapter 12. Actually, that's from Albert Einstein say, saying, it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. I wonder whether this applies to the current AI wave that we're experiencing. You know, Elon Musk and others right, have said that you know, this is a, one of the biggest threats to human civilization. What's your take on that? And uh, what's your prediction? 
Yeah, you know, I believe that the power of these technologies is vast and they can have a massive impact on our society uh, in many, many nefarious ways that we're only now just waking up to. You know, uh, when I, I literally started social re, uh, researching social media 20 years ago, four years before Facebook was founded. And at, in the early days, people used to say to me, Sinan, why are you studying this kind of toy technology? You know, you know, it's about, you know, like chihuahuas that look like blueberry muffins and photographs and so on. And I said, no, I think this is going to have a profound impact on our society. And now we're waking up to the dramatic effects that it can have either we're talking about AI algorithms, machine learning or social media on our democracy, on our economy, on our public health. And I do think it has exceeded our humanity in the sense that we haven't thought about what's, what is its effect on humanity and what is a human approach to designing and regulating and guideposting these technologies in a way that they have a positive rather than a negative impact on society. And I think that that conversation is highly overdue and it's essential to not just our digital future, but our societal future in general. That, that's fantastic. Uh, we, we also have a question from uh, Tyler Regino uh, asking about whether we should break up monopolistic companies like Google, Facebook for because they are short-term externality ridden profit motivations. Yeah, I believe you answered this question just now, but uh, if you want to expand. Yeah, sure. You know, in the book, so I, I, I take on this, this question directly in the book. So the social media economy runs on network effects. The value of a platform is the function of the number of users that it has. And network effects driven economies tend towards concentration and monopoly by economic momentum. So if you break up the market leader without changing the underlying dynamics of the economy, you're just going to tip the next Facebook-like company into market dominance. We need structural reform of the social media economy through interoperability, social network portability, and data portability. That has been shown in the cell phone market and the messenger market to reduce concentration. And by the way, the value that comes from networks is in the connections that you make between people on those networks. If you tear a network apart without making its component parts interoperable by law, um, you will destroy all of that consumer surplus that you have created in the network while not solving the monopoly problem. So you need structural reform of the economy, whether you break Facebook up or not. After structural reform, if we still want to break up Facebook, we can look at that. Breaking up Facebook without the structural reform doesn't solve any of the market failures, doesn't solve market concentration, and uh, will destroy value without ensuring it. There's uh, an act before Congress right now called the Access Act, which would require uh, social media platforms over 100 million users to be interoperable. We need to start there by passing that act, and then we need to move forward from there. Well, I know that we still have a number of questions, but we've reached the end of our hour. Um, so hopefully there will be a, a sizable chunk of you who are the lucky raffle winners and will be receiving a, a copy of this book. And for those who were the unlucky ones, again, uh, Sinan has shared with us his link of how you can go purchase the book. Thank you so much uh, for talking with us this hour. Uh, thanks to Gordon for helping to moderate this event and thanks to everyone who attended. Um, and please be on the lookout for future events from the Smith Analytics Consortium. Really appreciate you having me. Uh, this was a fantastic conversation. I am posting the uh, book link in the chat right now. Thank you, Sinan. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.